Thanks very much, Benson. Uh, well, as Mr. Assange's Australian lawyer, um, we wrote to the Federal Police um, and to the State Department in June of this year, advising them of our um, retention uh, as Mr. Assange's legal practitioners. That was at the time that the, f the first tranche of material was released, uh, and that was when Mr. Assange was in Australia. Um, surprisingly, um, we've not had a reply either from the attorney or from the federal police or from um, the State Department, other than to acknowledge um, receipt of the correspondence. And taking up Spencer's um, uh, point, I've asked the attorney, um, the robust defender of Mr. Assange, to consider an investigation um, pursuant to Division 115 of the Commonwealth Criminal Code. Now, you won't know of this um, particular division because it's never been invoked, um, but it is headed Harming Australians. And in particular, um, Division 115.4 says this, um, a person is guilty of an offence if the person engages in conduct outside Australia and the conduct causes serious harm to another person and the other person is an Australian citizen or resident of Australia and the first mentioned person is reckless as to causing serious harm to the Australian citizen or resident of Australia or any other person by the conduct. Serious harm is defined as including psychological or mental harm. Now, I'm, I've written to the attorney and to the uh, Commissioner of the Federal Police saying that comments emanating from the United States, um, particularly the presidential nominee from the Republican Party, uh, Mike Huckabee, calling for Mr. Assange's assassination, <laughs> has caused um, Mr. Assange mental harm. <laughs> and um, as a defender of an Australian citizen, I've asked the attorney to initiate an investigation as to the conduct of Mike Huckabee and others um, and um, to afford Mr Assange the protection that is um, due to him. I'll be interested to see the reply that we get to that correspondence. Um, I'm hoping that um, Mr Huckabee and others are charged. Um, this um, legislation, of course, has extraterritorial application. <laughs> um, as I said, it's never been invoked. Um, and uh, although uh, perhaps wrongly I've been a previous critic of the very wide net that's been cast in counter-terrorism legislation, uh, this is a perfect opportunity for the attorney to be even-handed um, in his approach. Um, so I'll wait to see what happens. I'll also wait to receive co um, a, an acknowledgement from the Australian Federal Police of my correspondence dating back to June, confirming that we, we understand that Mr Assange is a person of interest. Uh, let's see what happens. Uh, we're going to take questions, uh, and I know that you'll be champing at the bit to make statements, um, but we'd ask the questions to be relatively confined. Just imagine you're in the High Court um, and you've got a uh, very short um, scope. So we'll start with the person down the back with their hand up. Thank you. Right at the back near the door. Um, firstly, I'd like to say I fully support the motivation behind this meeting and the spirit and the intent of it. I'd also like to add that I think there's some fundamental foundational situations that really do need to be addressed overall here, and that is, as one of our speakers has said, we ought to be able to trust our politicians. That should be a given for all of us. However, until we can get politicians that we can trust, we need to think at how we pay them, how much we pay them, how we elect them, and how we make them both criminally and financially accountable as any other common public director of a public company would be in, uh, in the case of wrongdoings. Uh, if we can address that situation, then I believe our governments can be trusted to withhold from us that which they think ought to be withheld and should be charged with divulging to us everything else. Thank you. Do you and do you have a question? No, just a statement. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to ask people to put, rather than make statements, simply ask questions. Um, and uh, for the purposes of anyone else that might be monitoring these proceedings, can you please identify who you are? <laughs>
Thank you. We'll start with the person up the front here. My name is Chris Morgan. I barrack for the Western Bulldogs. <laughs> Speak as long as you like, sir. <laughs> And I'm one of them. But I've got to just tell you, Peter, you have been a very, very loyal supporter of Julia. When she got into power, I was ecstatic. But this turnaround in her demeanour either was there or it has just happened. But I am absolutely pissed off the way she's changed the colours. Uh, and you're inviting Peter to make a comment on that. Yes. Well, I think I've already um, said that I, 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 I like Julia. Um, I, I've worked with her for a long time, and, and equally Rob McClellan. You know, uh, he used to, before he was in Parliament, worked at Turner Freeman um, in Sydney, who do a lot of asbestos work, and we did a lot of work together in the 80s and the, the 90s. They are both decent people. Um, I know them to have um, been on the the right side of the barricades in a lot of fights and, and to me it is, as I said, a salutary lesson in uh, what power can do. I, I, I'm, I'm deeply disappointed um, but I hope that they'll be hearing the message and the, the, the backlash as John's called it um, tonight so that even if it um, isn't something that comes from their own philosophies, um, maybe it's their own little focus group on it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, good day. My name's Andy Sprake. I'm from Central Victoria. I, I, I believe that it was Mr. Assange who handed himself into the um, to the uh, British police. Yeah, that's right. For to, to answer questions about this situation in Sweden, what what why if he's being held now, what warrant is he being held under, and is it like something that uh, that we can do, like someone being held in an Indonesian prison illegally? Uh, with no evidence or anything like that. So what warrant has he been held under? Or we'll refer to senior counsel on that question. Uh, thanks very much, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a comment. <laughs> uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I, in ordinary extradition proceedings, um, there will be some process by which a person, if they're a flight risk, can be held. I don't know the details of the English situation, but I assume it's all kosher. Um, I might just add to that, um, as I um, briefly alluded to in my um, talk, um, the warrant is a warrant that's been issued by the Swedish Prosecutor's Office. Uh, it is a warrant um, asking that uh, the British authorities return uh, Mr. Assange to Sweden in order to answer questions uh, about allegations of sexual offences um, that um, have been made by two women with whom he had some um, brief um, relationship with as well. What do you like? <laughs> um, so what the British courts have now have to decide first is whether or not um, the strength of the evidence might justify um, uh, Mr. Assange's um, extradition. Um, but the great problem the extradition um, proceedings are likely to face uh, that um, this warrant is not um, to return Mr. Assange to Sweden in order to face charges of rape, um, unlawful coercion, molestation and so on, which are offences on the warrant. Uh, it is a warrant simply demanding that Britain return Mr Assange to Sweden in order to answer questions as part of a preliminary investigation on the basis of which a decision to charge him or not to charge him will be made. Uh, and it doesn't seem to me that uh, that case um, for extradition is a particularly strong one. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Speakers, uh, I applaud this initiative. I should begin by identifying myself as a uh, former diplomat um, and a conservative voter, so if you want to start throwing the cabbages, start now. <laughs> uh, and I know, Mr. Chairman, you're looking for a, uh, a question, not a statement. Yes. But um, just on the issue of consular protection, uh, can I say um, I remember being involved in providing consular assistance to an Australian murderer in Hong Kong. And the issue of consular protection transcends everything else. Every Australian passport holder deserves everything we can throw at them to get them back to our system of law and justice. And if you want to see what happens to them in some other third states, um, back off that principle and we've lost our democracy. 
Um, so uh, I'm appalled, uh, as most people in this room are, at the fact that we haven't thrown our hands straight in the air to provide every constant assistance to this man. And I pick up John Fain's point that this issue transcends uh, political boundaries. It's about a humanity, democracy, legal issue. Um, if I can cut straight to the question, um, how do we, in our Australian system of law and justice, address this rapidly emerging issue of cyber transparency, which will challenge both our right to freedom and privacy, on the one hand, which is seminal, and the other seminal right to free speech and personal liberty? That's my question. You've got one minute to answer that, uh, <laughs> gentlemen. Who'd like to have a go, John? I've always wanted to say, um, as my learned friend said, so I'm going to start off with that. Uh, I think each of the speakers has contributed part of the answer to that. And if you let people in positions of authority and power incrementally take things away from you, you don't get them back. So it's not against the law to embarrass people. And yet that is the net effect. And I find it highly amusing that politicians are on the one hand, from Kevin Rudd and Wayne Swan to people in the United States saying, oh, everybody knew that, so what? It's all, you know, water off a duck's back, was Kevin Rudd's response, whilst at the same time we're being told that this material is so serious a threat to democracy, the rule of law and the national security apparatus, that it must be stopped. Well, which one is it? Is it water off a duck's back, or is it a threat to national security, and international security? You can't have it both ways. So my argument, look fair and simple, is that they're still dissembling. They're still <coughs> making it up as they go. They are still trying to find reasons to do what they themselves know should be done. And it's going to be up to, I suspect, a broad coalition of people, people power, whatever it might be, in order to let them know the extent of people's displeasure. I can't see any other way. Can I just add to that? I actually believe in rights to privacy. Um, and I think that the law ought to enshrine both in terms of the internet and people's um, um, private rights order order for um, protection, particularly um, given some of the media habits which have grown up in recent years with particular sections of the press, present company excluded, of course. Um, but this isn't about privacy. Uh, you know, if, if, if Kevin Rudd were having some other form of relationship with Hillary, it might be no one's business. But, but when he's having a discussion about military options, that's not about privacy. Everyone's got a right to know that because because it affects us. Um, and so I think that balanced against um, this issue of, of the right of, to individual privacy, including the private rights of our politicians, there has to be broader protection of our right to know things and there has to be greater challenge um, and debate over these traditional defences, we you know, we've become hardened. We've become used to people uh, being told. Um, you know, a famous, uh, a recently uh, deposed politician once said, um, "I need to know that, but you don't need to know that." It's completely unacceptable, um, and that's from obviously the labour side of the of, of the fence. It's unacceptable for people to say it's about national security, and therefore you don't need to know. So far, what we've found out about WikiLeaks has demonstrated that it's nothing to do with. Um, with issues of, of either privacy or national security, but all about things that the politicians wish we didn't know because it's a cynical abuse of power. Now, I'm um, sorry, we're going to finish it there because we're on a tight um, time scale here. Um, but I'm pleased we've had this meeting tonight because um, had Mr Assange been deported back to Australia, of course you all know that the National Security Information Act would be invoked. Um, there would be a suppression of all proceedings. Um, the, um, they would be conducted in camera. And Julian Burnside would have to have a security clearance. And if he failed to have a security clearance, evidence against Mr Assange could be received in both his legal representative's absence and in his own absence uh, and be received by the jury. Uh, thank God he hasn't been deported back to Australia. Um, and let's hope he has a fair trial in the UK um, and maybe in Sweden.